Welcome back, everybody, to Be the, Be the Trader. Today, I have a very special guest, Mike Huddy. A lot of you guys already know who he is. If you don't, go look him up on YouTube. Just type his name. He's been interviewed before, so we're really not going to go into a whole where are you from, what got you into trading, because this that's been there, done that. We're just cool. going to have a conversation to see where you're at today, my man. So, Mike, welcome to the show, man. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to be here. Absolutely. So, I appreciate you being here. You know, we were talking just for a little bit right before we start recording and we were talking about how we're all kind of like working on things. I'm personally working on new strategy, just slowly changing things up. And, and you mentioned that you're also kind of working on something. Can you talk about that? Yeah. So the whole thing about uh, trading is it's, it's a compounding learning curve. Like every six months you think you master something and then six months later, something's going to change about the way you trade and it's going to throw you off. And even me five years in, I'm still changing things. Um, specifically, I'm changing uh, how I manage risk how I manage my positions. Um, I kind of call it Project 1K Mix, uh, Project 1K Risk. Uh, it's just a term that I coined with a friend. And what it is is before, before like, I guess, March, um, the way I size into plays, and, and I feel like sizing in is such a good conversation. So many traders have a hard time sizing in. And everyone thinks that once they go on a hot streak, they should size in bigger and they should get bigger size. And then what I found is when I did that in year three, I took a really big loss. So a little, little background story, My it was about two and a half years into trading that I started making six figs, okay? And not in one trade, but you know I made six figs that year. And that was kind of like the threshold I needed to cross in order to consider myself like a profitable trader. And very shortly after making six figures, I took a $25,000 loss on a stock called Enbev, which was a marijuana stock from 2018. And the reason I took that $25,000 loss was because I thought I had made a lot of money. I thought that I should size up. I thought I knew what I was doing. And so then NBEV comes around and it spikes from two to six, very similar to a stock that we saw today, GNUS. Yep. And um, it was the exact same pattern. And I was day early. I was yesterday. Um, and so what happened was, I don't know how I ended up with it, but I ended up with 30,000 shares short of a $6 stock. I was margined. I had more money in that stock than was in my account. It isn't a pattern I would ever play today. And I took a fat loss. And what that loss did to me in the long run was it messed up my mind and it messed up my emotions. And yeah. not only did I take that $25,000 loss, I think I took a $10,000 loss very shortly after that as well. So it was just kind of like two big back-to-back -back hits that rocked my world, you know, so to speak. And ever since, my sign has been different. I, 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 I had to like become modest and that, that's going to sound weird because my, my daily, I had to like make very modest daily goals. Now, modest is going to sound relative now, but my goal was 2K every day, 10K a week, 400K a year. That was the goal. That's what I was told to like think. And like, you know, if you can just hit your daily goal, like good, you know, you don't need to hit home runs. Just hit those singles and just come to work in like wallet pad, so to speak, until you have that home run trade, whatever. Um, so that's what I was doing. I was trying to make 2K a week. Uh, and, and what I realized was the way I was sizing in, the way I was managing my positions was all wrong. It was very emotionally based. What I was doing was I was saying, okay, this is an ideal setup. I need $30,000 in this stock because it's an ideal setup. I'll do it nine times out of 10. And this is where I deserve to take a fat loss if I'm going to take a loss because nine times out of 10, I don't take a loss. Um, so that one time I take that loss, it should be fine. And what I ended up doing was throwing $30,000 into a stock at not the most risk reward opportune moments and pretty much risking 10% or $3,000 every time. Um, and I found most times I couldn't put in the $30,000 you know, worth of stock because I wasn't comfortable with where the stock was at, or I wasn't comfortable with some aspect of the trade, the risk reward. Yeah. And then I would most of the time end up with a lot smaller size. Um, I kind of skipped ahead, but so what, what NBEV did to me was it really rocked my world with sizing. And if anything, I sized the opposite way. I went way back to very, very little size. I'm talking like 10 to $15,000 positions. And I was, you know, this is two and a half, three years later since NBEV. And I have the consistency, but I'm still warped in my mind with sizing. Right. Um, and so I went to Gratani, Tim Gratani. I'm sure everyone who's listening to this knows who that is. And I said, dude, I know what I'm doing. I know, I know damn well what this pattern looks like. And I know, I know risk can be like, you know, give or take, there can be some slippage sometimes, but why am I not sizing in when I know this is like, I think we started talking when I know 
CODX, um, APT, APRN, WRTC, when they were all going nuts. And there's this one moment in the pattern that I know, like hit that and there's a pullback. And it usually retests the lows. Like statistically, I have the whole thing in my head. And for whatever reason, every time that setup comes around, I'm not sized in. I have less than like $5,000 in the stock. And I make a 20, 30% profit. So it ends up, you know, 20, 30, 40%, whatever it is, it ends up paying the bills. But then I see other traders do way better. And it, and it makes me feel like I should size up. And then I see people post on Twitter and people are saying, size up, size up, size up. And I'm saying, why can't I size up? Why do I have such a hard time with it? And I know it's because of NBEF. And it's a, and it's a double-sided sword. So I went to Gratani. I asked a more experienced trader his thoughts. And that's what you should do. If you have access to any kind of traders who are more experienced or do something better than you, like feed off people throughout life. Ask questions, right? So I went to Gratani. I said, do what the hell? And he said, look, man. No matter what I do, when I get in a stock, I'm risking $10,000 flat. I mean, obviously, there's some exceptions. There's, you know, some speculation. Maybe you're just dabbling in some airline stocks, and that's going to be a different scenario. But in terms of, like, what we come to work to do every day in terms of the penny stock framework and pattern of those sorts, yeah. he's risking $10,000. And I go, okay, so what's your point? And he goes, I have a set risk. No matter what I do, I lose $10,000. That has nothing to do with how much money is in the stock. It could be a hundred thousand. It could be a thousand dollars. Either way, he's going to risk ten thousand dollars. So he told me, he told me, you should try this for yourself. You should try risking a thousand dollars, no matter what. And that's that's a level that I came up thousand. But he didn't give me a number. In the moment, he didn't give me a number. He said, you need to figure out a number that no matter what you do, if you take that loss, it's a thousand. It's it's going to be that number. Consist like find consistency within your losses, pretty much which I don't think people talk about finding hmm. consistency within your losses. Right. Cause okay. you know, sometimes I'd have a $3,000 loss. Sometimes I have a $5,000 loss. Sometimes I'd have a $500 loss. What is, why is it so inconsistent? Why is it so sporadic and all over the place? Right. So we tried something new. We tried something called thousand uh, dollar risk, which means no matter what my play is, I need to throw in thousand dollars and then work my way up from there. And Gratani did something very similar on YouTube where he went through like nine months of monthly recaps where he had to size himself back down after a really nasty loss, uh, two six figure losses back to back. Kind of a similar story. And what I found is now I'm much more selective about my plays with thousand dollar risk. Like, for instance, I could be risking a penny in some circumstances and have thousand dollar risk. And think about the amount of shares that you mm -hmm. have for a yeah. penny risk, right? Oftentimes it's like 10 cent risk and I have 10,000 shares, but there are circumstances, scenarios where if you're patient enough for that exact perfect opportune moment and risk reward, you don't always have to be perfect. But if you do nail it, you're going to have some really tight risk reward. For me, it's going to be a thousand dollar loss if I'm wrong. And to the downside, what I'm seeing is I'm making the same money back before I would throw money at a stock because emotionally I said this is a great setup in my mind. It wasn't because the chart went somewhere that I really liked. It wasn't because of whatever variable I want to throw at you. It was because I liked the stock a lot. So I wanted to put a lot of money in the stock. Now it's like, okay, I just need to find a point where a thousand dollar risk makes sense. And to the downside, I'm going to make a lot more money or the upside, whichever short or long. Um, and, and I'm finding setting myself to a consistent risk makes me change the whole perspective I have about a play. Is it worth a thousand dollars? Right. If I have a thousand dollars worth of that stock, is it what a thousand dollar position or is it ten thousand dollar position? Right. Then we get into the conversation of sizing up and people go like you should size up in the time when markets mad and like markets are doing what they're doing right now. You should size up. Well, what does sizing up really mean? It makes me start thinking and it's changed because I used to think when someone says size up, OK, if I had ten thousand dollars in a stock, put twenty thousand dollars in a stock and that's sizing up. Now it's different. Sizing up would be changing my consistent risk level. If I had a thousand dollar risk, now I have thousand two hundred dollar risk. I just sized up 20 percent right now. It's not going to feel like much in the moment of trading, but that does do make a difference. And just that 200 can be the difference of, you know, 10K in, in a very ideal scenario um, that that 20 percent extra risk. So sizing up, that doesn't mean I, I had 10,000 shares and now I can throw 100,000 shares at a stock. I can already do that. No matter what, if I have that thousand dollar risk, but now if I want to do instead of thousand dollar risk, I want to do thousand five hundred dollar risk. It's a whole nother game. And what I'm often finding is when I have those really ideal risk reward moments, I don't want the thousand dollar risk. Why? 
because that's a lot of shares and it scares me and that's emotional. And so I got to work through for me personally, being able to, in the most ideal risk reward situations, you can have a very massive dollar size position, right? But still have thousand dollar risk if you're wrong. And it's about being confident and being confident enough with your setup and knowing it enough to say, hey, this is that is the risk level. I can identify it. It holds more often than not. And I can have that thousand dollar risk. And it's not about the dollar amount in my in the stock. It's about I never know how much I'm going to make. But when, when the stock goes in my favor, I never know how much I'm going to make every single time I know how much I'm going to lose. And that's a thousand dollars consistently across the so, board for the past three months. So, I mean, so you're telling me for the longest time you were really not thinking that way because I, I feel like. You know, real talk, I feel like most of the time that's the only way to think, right? Like thinking how much you're going to risk first. And so I know you've been trading for a long time, man. I know you've been very successful and I know the way you trade works for you. And so I'm curious, were you thinking more, making sure I understand this correctly, are you just saying now, no matter what, if you're going to pick, if you're going to play any trade, you're going to find a spot, enter and always risk a thousand dollars, no matter what trade it is. Even if it's a trade, so that made you more selective now, so where you're not just kind of just trading other stuff that kind of looks like a good setup, but maybe not be. Either yeah. that is that really what you're saying? Because I know you know how to risk. I know you know how to manage risk. I know you know how to size in appropriately in terms of sizing. So I don't know if that's what you're really saying, or if you're really saying, because uh, it's not a like I, I'm just trying to understand like. Are you saying for the longest time you've been sizing in yourself and maybe it worked for you where you're just thinking, how much money do I want to put in the stock? And you're not thinking about how much you want to risk. Is that what you're saying? For the longest time, I was risking way too much to make the money I'm making. Okay. I was was putting myself in scenarios to lose a lot. I was always thinking risk first, but I was thinking, hey, I need need to at least be able to lose $3,000 in order to make a six figure trade. And that's not necessarily true. And that's what this whole like, like consistent risk consistency amongst my losses. Like I'm no longer emotionally putting an amount of money in a stock because of how good I think this overextended gap down is or whatever the setup is. It's no matter what it is, it's a thousand dollars. And so sometimes I'm like, okay, well it's still 50 cents away from green red. So I don't want to hit a button yet because that's only going to be what? 2000 shares. I want it 10 cents away from green red. Cause then I have 10,000 shares. Right. Gotcha. Gotcha. So you, you so were thinking different. I get it. I get it. Before when it was 50 cents away, that's where I would throw 30,000 shares in and say, OK, 50 cent risk on 30,000 shares. And that opened the door to disaster when I was wrong. I didn't cut a loss or whatever it is or if I had to get back in. So it's just a difference of perspective. And like I, I always was thinking risk first, but I was risking way too much. And it wasn't about really the chart. It was just about being in the stock on the right day. Mm. And then just trying to ride the momentum down. And so the, the shift in just like, is the play worth a thousand dollars? Is the risk reward worth a thousand dollars? Is there enough downside where if I am in with a thousand dollar risk, is it going to, you know, pay me a thousand dollars even like, you know, it's like, yeah. So I, I, I would recommend like, and I think the biggest thing is everyone thinks sizing up is putting more money in a stock. And that's my biggest point. Sizing up is not putting more money in a stock. Sizing up is being willing to lose more. And if you have a consistent risk, Sizing up can be something as harmless as from a thousand dollar risk to a thousand two hundred dollar risk or twenty dollar risk to thirty dollar risk. Right. And, and and it honestly changed the game for me when I found consistency in my losses, which is a new thing as of like the past three months. So much so that I hold myself accountable every time I don't have thousand dollar risk, whether it's less or more. I write it in the journal, whether or not I made money on the, on the stock or lost on the stock. I don't care. It's, Help me understand less. Risk. Help me understand less. Give me an understanding of that. What do you mean? CIDM yesterday was at 98 cents and I put 5,000 shares in at 98 cents long mm-hmm. and I was risking 90 cents. That's $500 risk. I should have at least had double that, at least 10,000 shares because that's $1,000 risk. And maybe I thought it was an opportune moment. I could have had 15,000. That's $1,500 risk, whatever it is. Um, but oftentimes I find myself with less than $1,000 risk. Why? Right. And yeah. so I go back and I dissect why, you know, is it a problem with the setup? Was it an arbitrary risk? Was I afraid to lose? And I'm detailing these. Or was it a mistake? And I'm detailing these things so that I can build my way back up to maybe one day having three, five, 10 K risk on every single trade that I take. Mm. That's how you get to okay. the next level. 
But too often people size up in the beginning and they think they need to throw more money at a stock. And they're like, what percent of my account should I throw at the stock? Well, that's not, if I ever tell someone to size up, it's not throw more money at a stock. It's change the way you, you think of, uh, increase your risk tolerance is pretty much what I think sizing up is. So, so what about the idea of, of um, because now that you're thinking that way, now I'm, I'm, I'm getting the full picture now. I'm understanding as in, because there's a lot of times I enter a stock and I you say my risk is, you know, let's just say it's a thousand. So we're keeping talking about a thousand. If it's a thousand dollar risk, but I only find out I, I get in half size. So I'm risking 500, right? And I tend to do that a lot actually recently with this, this new style it. of trading and I never get full size. And then I'm just like, fuck, because then, then when I'm right, I'm not making back, you know, what I'm supposed to make back. So and that was the genesis of the conversation. Yeah. That's so that's, that's interesting. Point. So you're yeah. saying, and I like that you shared that because now that's going to help a lot of people, I'm sure, because you need to question yourself, like, why am I scared to enter my full thousand shares for 10 cents? Like, why am I scared to enter that? Because you, you know, think you're it, a better entry because you think of this or that. And if that's why, that. then you better, then you should either wait for that better entry and you have FOMO or you should just don't take the setup. And, you know, if it's not your setup, right? It's I mean, not about being a hero. It's not about nailing the top. It's just about being in the play when you need to be in the play. Yeah. So oftentimes, like, okay, you're not going to nail the top, but if you're at least in game, like get in game and and what thousand, what set risk every time consistent across the board makes me do is it get it gets me in game. And like we were talking about earlier, I'm three months in and I still don't do it every time. There's still something that drives me to have less than thousand dollar risk. And it, it's not even like a thousand dollars. Like that's a very small amount of money for me to lose with what my account size is at now. But it's still mentally really tough to say, okay, this is the thousand dollar play. Yeah. And right now is where I need to get in. So, so what about, did, did, how do you handle that with, with actually, are you sizing in still or are you one shot? Are you two shots? Like how do you kind of see it planning out right now? Um, so sizing in, so with thousand dollar risk, I mean, it's one thing if I'm risking $10,000, right? Then yeah. I think sizing in is a totally different conversation, which is like, maybe you're doing it in pieces. Sometimes not. Sometimes you're just hitting it. Um, what I do, uh, I guess, I mean, I guess we can talk about, can we, can we talk about a chart from today? I mean, that's fine if you want to. So, so I mean, the, 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 the easy answer is whenever I'm sizing into a play and like, I want to like increase my, my risk idea, it involves moving my risk up. So like, I have this like first idea where I, I get in a stock. Okay. So CIDM, I wish we could have a chart in front of us, but CIDM, it broke out of 98 cents yesterday into the afternoon. And when I bought that, it was 90 cent risk. So it was like eight cents a risk. Very shortly after in this stage of the pattern, it held 97 cents as a, as a support level and started ripping up towards a buck, a buck 20. So in that moment, it's very plausible that I could move my risk from 90 cents to 97 cents. My entry is already 97 cents and I need to add thousand dollar risk now because I no longer have thousand dollar risk. Right now I'm break even. If I'm moving my risk up to my entry, not because it's my entry, but because the chart did the thing at my mm -hmm. entry. Yep. When I officially decide that like if it goes below that level, I'm cutting that loss. Well, I need to size into that loss and that loss still needs to be a thousand dollars. So now I've just, and, and, and it depends on what the risk reward gives me, you know, at one point, that happened with the IDM and I didn't size into it, but that's the scenario where I would size in when I can confidently move my risk up and I would find an entry to size into that new risk. I guess what I, I meant to I, as well, I guess what I was, I like that you said that, but I guess what I was really asking was your first entry. Are you now entering once, you know what I'm saying? To get your thousand yes. dollar risk every uh, time you enter, or is it like maybe two pieces, three that's pieces? Gonna set up by set up. That's going to be okay. set up by set up. So like an overextended gap down, Usually one shot, one kill. Something like GNUS today, I first started shorting in the 1130s and then they hit that S3. So I added risk and I and I doubled my size there. And then it slammed all the way to four, covered, and then it popped back up to green red, which was like eight bucks. And that's where my last short came in. And my risk was now eight bucks instead of 11 highs, which was where I started out in the beginning of the day. So when you have like a super volatile mover like that, where it's going to go from 11 to four in a day and then bounce back up to eight, I kind of size into that as it falls apart. There's a couple of bounces that I know that I like to hit as it falls apart. Um, if I'm doing an overextended gap down, I'm looking for a one-shot entry. 
if I'm doing like any kind of afternoon, intraday, high day breaks, it's like a one shot entry. You know, I, the more I fimble with that, with the, with the mouse and the buttons, the more I second guess myself. You know, I just want to be in and then just chill and say, hey, I know my risk. I know the odds of it breaking. If it happens, boom, thousand dollars. If it doesn't, I don't know. We'll see where it opens up tomorrow, whatever it is. So I, I know you were saying earlier that you, you've been playing and dabbling with like new strategies every so often because you mentioned earlier we, we were talking. I was sharing with Mike, for those of you, since we weren't recording, I was sharing with Mike that I kind of changed my own strategies for this month and just trying something new. And I had a hot streak and then now I'm in a freaking choppy land and yeah. not making anything. And, and you, Mike, you were saying something about how you still go through moments where, you know, you're you're killing it and then the market kind of changes and you kind of have to adjust how you're playing. Could you explain a little bit more about how how that can happen to people and how they should handle those situations? Well I, well, I actually think that we get in our head way too often about the market changing and stuff like that. Like, I, I feel like the market's been the same for the past, like, three months. Just freaking wild, right? Um, what I was really referring to was was the idea of, like, I, I think, especially as stock traders, I think there's, like, this innate feeling that we all want immediate results, you know, immediate gratification. That's why we're so quick to pay ourselves into, like, excessive whatever. Um, and I find that it often takes a while to, like, really implement something new when you're trading, like you need to have the screen time, you need to take the free throws, you need to take the shots probably 10,000 times before it starts to really become second nature. And I find far too often, like we get so frustrated with ourselves because we judge ourselves on a day by day basis, on a week by week basis, when in reality, that's not what we're judging ourselves on. Where are you going to be a year, five, 10 years from now, right? Just because you had one bad week. If anyone, if any business owner judged themselves on a week by week basis, then in coronavirus, times while, while all businesses are closed, like you're losing money week by week. But in the long run, what are you really doing? You know, and obviously this isn't a small business. This is stock trading. But a week of roughness is like to be expected. Everyone has off days. Even Kobe Bryant doesn't have a stellar game. Right. Like it happens to everyone, um, especially like me and you. Like we're not Kobe, yeah. you know, <laughs> so we're gonna have off weeks. Um, but, and the most important thing is to like not be so hard on yourself and understand that don't blame outside factors. Just see what you can do within yourself to continue to work on your game, continue to work on your free throw, your swing, whatever it is. Um, it's not going to all change and click overnight. I'm in this game five years and I'm still finding out stuff that seems second nature to you. And I have to like break it down to like really show you the paradigm shift in my head. Yeah, no. So, so now that got me thinking like, so to give you an example and maybe this will help. Let's say, like for, for instance, let's just use me for example. I the I, I'm, I'm working out. I'm good at let's just say overextended gap down. That's one of my prime setups, right? I'm good at that, making money. I'm doing well, growing. And then I'm like, you know what? I see these other patterns. Let me try this out, and and they try that out. Are you saying that when you try something new, that you're gonna you're basically starting over? Like you're kind of starting over. You're gonna you're gonna pretty much make the same mistakes almost that you made on this strategy that you now mastered that you're now going to make here. Is that what you're, is that basically what you're saying? No, <laughs> not, <laughs> not necessarily um, because you do learn. I mean, like you do learn price action, you do learn support sure. and resistance, key levels, what matters. And you take that forward. And, and, and that is, it's not for nothing. Um, but going into learning a new strategy, you know, that that's just a, it's another ball game of a conversation, which we yeah. can yeah, I want to know, like, when you're learning a new strategy, how is that like for you? Like, what, what's your process in doing that? That's very applicable right now. So for the longest time, for the longest time first, I had to figure out what my strategy was. And that was stage one. Like, I remember way in the beginning, it was like no longs. And then, okay, definitely don't short a green day. Okay. And then, okay, red days. But I like them when they were multi-day runners. And then I like it when they got down and whatever. I eventually found my way to overextend a gap down. And recently... I started looking into long patterns. Um, I kind of forgot where I was going with that tangent. Remind me of the question. Sorry. Yeah, no, you're good. It was more so of when you're trying to do a new strategy yourself. Like, Sorry. how do you go about doing that, that process? That process. So in, in, in the past, it was see someone else do it and then replicate. I, I find like it, if like, and obviously don't follow everyone, follow the guy that does it the best. For me, it was, it was Gritani. Like, I'm just going to mimic exactly what he does. And I watched him do it every day. I was in the challenge chat and I was, you know, elsewhere and I just saw him on Twitter or whatever it was. And I moved him. 
And I asked him a bunch of questions when I had the opportunities to, and he always answered them, and that was sick. And that's how I learned the overextended gap down, and that's how I learned first red day shorting. Um, what I could never do was long a stock. Uh, like, I knew how. I could hit the button. I could long a stock. I could hit the button, and I'd be long a stock. But I couldn't stay patient. I couldn't adhere to my risk. I felt like every time I bought a breakout, it dunked on me. And every time I didn't buy a breakout, it went to the moon. You know, and I just felt like, you know, longs was just this headache where I could just never get it. Um, and that, that that changed recently because I started doing the, the thing that I thought I'd never do, which is tracking a setup, um, using, a st- using a statistical approach to longs and carving out some kind of criteria that is so specific that it's hard to find. Unfortunately, in this market, it's kind of easy to find. But and in, in, in most times, I feel like they're not going to come up every week because I'm so stringent on my criteria. And it's become to the point where it's like, I'm really excited to update the stat sheet because it's like, okay, more evidence, more evidence, more evidence. What is the correct risk level? What is the right reward to expect? What's my reward to expect when it gaps up? What's that risk reward relationship look like to what my original risk was, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And doing that has completely has put me in the game of longs. I've been, I've been trading longs now, um, yeah. intraday yeah. high day breaks, which if you go back to Tim Bertani's first interview with you, I think that's exactly what he was talking about, intraday high day breaks. And I was like, huh. And from that interview, I think it was that night or that day I longed WRTC at like two bucks. And then the next day it opened up at four. And I was like, fuck, they're onto something there. (laughs) But I can't just long every high day break in the afternoon. I needed something really freaking specific. So I started tracking it. And I found because longs, there's like a judgment call. You know, you need to understand the news. You need to understand the volume. You need to understand the chart. You need to understand the psychology. You need to understand the fundamentals, um, where the dilution is at, et cetera. There's a lot of different aspects to the long trade. The short trade's different. When you look at something like anything that's up 5,000% or whatever it is, like the first red day, it kind of stays the first red day. And you don't really need to know more that the, other than the fact that when you short a stock and it goes down, you make money. Um, so it made a lot of sense to just naturally like short these overextended runners and like just by the nature of them being overextended, you were in a serious event and dangerous situation. That's not the same thing when you're longing something day one. You know, there's a bunch of things moving day one. How do you know that's the right one is the question. And so the statistical approach has really helped me. You know, what kind of market cap do I want to see? A bunch of different questions I've been asking the stat sheet. Yeah. And so and so. And so. Are, are you finding yourself more focused, more, more doing longs lately than shorting or pretty much the same thing? God, it pains me to say it, but I think I've made more money longing this year than shorting. And it pains me to say it. Like, I, I, I hate saying that. Um, obviously, when I have a day like Gina, like today I made roughly $10,000 on Genus, shorting it. And when I have a Genus, a WRTC or whatever it was, an APRN, an APT, when I have those, like, I can clean up. But I haven't seen too many of those this year. Like it's it's been a lot of like one and done runners. Yep. And I don't necessarily like those because I like them. I just like the multi-day runners. I find that that has a much like they're much more extended. They have much more volume by the third or fourth day. And it creates that really nice panic unwind. Um, and I find that the less extended and less multi-day runnish that they are, the more chop there is, the more weirdness mm-hmm. to the setup there is. And so you know, it's really not about trading anymore. Like, I really don't want to trade unless I have to. And I found that I really wasn't shorting much this year. And now I find that I'm like long a stock every week. And then I wake up to 100% gap up. I mean, I didn't take CIDM overnight, but holy crap, if I did, you know, 98 cents to six, right? Yeah. So it's just, it's been a very favorable market for the longs. And I, I picked up on that in, a, in April when I wasn't doing the long thing. Like, I was like, no. And then I watched, you know, some traders trade APT and trade it from freaking seven to 30. And I'm like, OK, like there's some merit there. Like I, I want to with the short selling, like you can never expect to make more than 60 percent in the day. Like 60 percent is that level where like, are you really going to see a stock crash more than 60 percent? Maybe if it's an OTC fraud or like, you know, um, bad biopharmaceutical. But you're not going to make more than 60 percent in a day on a short. I mean, what, it's one thing to still be in the stock when it's down 60 percent and you haven't covered a dime. And then for it to stay down there and close down there, like it's just a, it's so hard to make that big of a percent return. But then you have something with the longs where you can buy something at 98 cents and the next day within the first 10 minutes of market open, it's at six bucks. And that's 600 percent. 
And so there's, there's, there, there, that's, that's shiny. That's very shiny to me. It's like, it's yes. like, how could I not want to be able to ascertain some of that opportunity? I mean, there's enough to go around. So I have been dabbling and, and at first when I started doing this, it was $500 risk. It wasn't thousand dollar risk. I had it different. The shorts were one thing and I understood the shorts and I do understand longs. I have lived and worked with Roland for the past, I don't, I don't live with him, but we've, we've worked at Arizona for the past year and a half together. So I have insight into a very experienced, long, successful long trader's mind. And so it, it was time for me to open up this can of whoop ass again, which I have been so scared to do for, for years because what made me consistent was throwing away the longs. Like that's what made me consistent. It was no more longs, only shorts. And then once I could focus on my shorts, I could dive in and where exactly am I profitable within the shorts. And that helped me find a very specific moment, an opportunistic moment to be short on a stack. And that opportunity came around frequently enough that I didn't need anything else, you know? Yeah. And, and so, and before we wrap this up, you know, I, I want to, you we brought something up earlier and you were like, you know, it seems like, it sounds like when you're explaining, like when something doesn't pop up, you know, you don't want to trade. I get that. But like, are you saying that because you have these criteria, both for long and short, regardless, that now are you more of a trader who who may trade once a day or not at all? Or are you more of a trader who maybe at least trades once every day? Like, what would you say? Um, I'm a trader that maybe trades once. I would say on average, it's one trade a day. Um I would say, yeah, on average, that means some days I don't trade at all. And if mm -hmm. I do, it's a very small paper cut and I know it's stupid. And like, I guess it's hard for me to like really tell you as of recent, because I think quarantine makes me do some annoying shit on the market just because I'm just in front of my laptop and I couldn't go outside, like especially in the beginning of quarantine. And so that was like, there were some monopoly pokes and some degenerate plays in there that were, that was like, fr I hate doing those. And it, it's very frustrating. I'd rather just get up from my laptop and walk away for the day. Like, before quarantine, that's what I would do. If by 7 a.m. there wasn't a multi-day extended something and there wasn't something spiking up in that kind of fashion where I knew it was going to be a play the next day, yeah, most days I wasn't trading. It was like three trades a week. And that's what all of 2019 felt like. All of 2019 felt like three trades a week. And it wasn't yeah. because I, it, was, it was a lack of opportunity. It was a lack of setup. Um, then this year came and, and, and the market did shift in 2020. I mean, there's an obvious shift. And, and volume and momentum and extension and all that, right? Um, we're seeing a new 200 million share runner every day. <laughs> every I think like seven today, right? Um, but yeah, um, okay. I, I, I would say that I, I found that the more and more I focused on what works, the less and less I started trading. I understand. And so, so if there's any way that people may have questions, they may want to learn more about you, Mike, what is the best way for them to do that? So I, I work with the steady trade team with Tim Bowen. Um, steady trade team. I give webinars for them every Friday uh, after market close. Um, I just get on an hour and I review all the plays from the last week. Every it's, every it's weekly, so it's awesome. And they're all archived. And I just, it's not even a question thing. I just get on my laptop and I start screaming at everyone. I pull up like four charts and I go through the price action and I go through my entries and exits and the thesis and the whys behind the trades. And then I discuss what we saw today and what I'm looking for within the next week. So like this Friday, I'll be going over Genus, CIDM, DLPM, maybe a couple of OTCs we've seen, some bankrupt stocks we've seen. And I like doing it, you know? I really have a good time just coming and, 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 and talking or else it just stays in my head and I end up staring at the wall. Um, so yeah, every Friday. Every Friday I do that with, with the Steady Trade team. Um, for access, I have no idea. I'm just a content guy. Like I just told them I would do it. And other than that, I'm in the Tim Sykes chat, you know, I'm in the Tim Sykes chat and I like to talk there and I'm in Roland's chat and I like to, I just chat. Awesome. Awesome. Well, well, listen, Mike, I appreciate you being here today and joining me because it was a pleasure yeah. talking to you and I appreciate it very much, man. Let's do it again.